Okay, we are on to our next expert presentation. Uh, this is by Jehan Shroff, a senior partner, Consortia Legal. Uh, the topic uh, of the presentation is Data Protection Act 2023 Impact on Insurers, Intermediaries, and InsurTechs. Uh, Jehan is the co founding partner of Consortia Legal and heads the corporate transaction advisory, restructuring, and data uh, the data protection practices at, at, at that firm. It's based out of Mumbai, specializes in domestic and cross-border transactions, private equity and venture capital investments, M&A, joint ventures, debt financing. Uh, Jehan. Th thank you, everyone, for coming. I mean, I know it's been a little late. We've uh, been running um, way past schedule, but uh, thank you for coming. Really appreciate that. You know, everyone's been talking about uh, data, you know, we, we manage this data and we manage that data and we can integrate this on your system and we can do that on your system. And I'm like, you know, that's all great, but hello, hello, what about the, what about the Data Protection and Data Privacy Act that has come into force? And uh, you know, people are like, oh, yes, 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 that's very important. And, um, you know, what, what we see is just that there's just a general, um, I, I wouldn't say lack of awareness, but a general, um, lack of initiative when it comes to, uh, you know, just uh, uh, respecting an individual's data. So just uh, to give a brief uh, overview on what the act is and how it's going to affect uh, both insurers and the insurtech sector. Um, yeah, okay. So, um, you know, just before we start on that, any thoughts on what, what the Hindi word for privacy is? Anyone? Because we talk a lot about data privacy. Any thoughts on what privacy is? Anyone wants to take out Google? No? Okay. So here's the beauty. There is no word. <laughs> right? And because there is no word, effectively that becomes one of the key challenges on how do I disseminate information to the two people who are not conversant in English uh, and uh, while I, I, I completely appreciate that Hindi is not the national language, and that was something that was once told to me, but why are you only talking about Hindi, right? I mean, there are so many national languages, all in the Constitution. And I'm like, yes, absolutely, but you know, how many people speak the regional languages, right? I mean, a lot of Hindi. And there's just, just no word in Hindi for it. So how do we get the Aam Admi, as we call it, to appreciate that their data needs to be respected and protected, right? Um, just in terms of what we have under the act um, for data protection, uh, it covers personal data, which is the data only of the individuals. This has nothing to do with data of uh, corporates. That those are all covered under the uh, confidentiality agreements that we lawyers all love to sign. Um, it's broadly based on GDPR, uh, and data can only be processed for legitimate purposes. What amounts to legitimate purposes is actually mentioned in the act. And unless you're doing something for legitimate purposes, you will fall foul of the act. Um, you can only collect data with consent except in certain specific instances where it can be collected uh, without consent. And um, the big thing and that everyone has been really happy about that has come is that uh, cross-border transfer of data is now permitted. We've had several uh, to's and fro's um, on this. With, you know, we first started with saying that, oh, you know, you have to have data localization in India. Certain kinds of data cannot leave the country. The server has to be in, the, in India. Then we moved on to say that, oh, you know, we can do it um, as long as, uh, you know, the country is on the, on the green list. But which countries would for come on the green list was, you know, not uh, really clarified. And now finally where we have reached is that it's freely permitted except to countries that are on the red list. So unless, you know, and what we think is that these would uh, basically be your FATF um, non-compliant countries. So as long as you're FATF compliant, we see that, uh, you know, data should be able to move freely across jurisdictions. Uh, and yes, in case of any breach, the, um, there are certain obligations to be followed. There's a, you need to inform the authority. Uh, there's going to be a new authority called the Data Protection Board. You need to inform them and you need to inform the individuals whose data has been compromised. In terms of, uh, you know, what, what data it does fall within the uh, definition of the act. So basically the moment you're processing digital data in India, you will need to follow the act. It doesn't matter, um, you know, whether then the, the, the processing is of an Indian resident or not. The moment that processing is happening in India, you need to follow the act. Uh, it needs to be in the digital form. 
And uh, if you are collecting data in the physical form, then the moment you move uh, to the uh, digital form is when the act applies. And that becomes really critical, especially for intermediaries, because uh, at the outset, you know, when they are, um, when they are talking to the assured, you know, a lot of data is collected first in the physical form and then obviously digitalized. So when the consent will be taken, you know, needs to be seen carefully because the act will only apply once you once the data is digitized. And even um, data that is collected outside of India, uh, if the processing is in connection with activities or goods or services of individuals in India, then you will, the act will also apply. So there is extraterritorial um, or foreign jurisdiction of the act as well. So that is something also to keep in mind. Uh, this again would become really important for cross-border reinsurers if they are collecting any personal data. I mean, usually this is done on an anonymized basis, but if there is any personal data that is flowing, then that the act will also apply to CBRs. Uh, so in terms of what are the different kinds of data, data is basically everything under the sun that's in a... Uh, in the digitized form, but what is important to us is what is personal data, and that is any data of the individual, as long as you can identify that individual with that data, that effectively becomes personal data. So my email address, my telephone number also is my personal data. And um, unlike most other jurisdictions, we don't have sensitive data anymore. I mean, currently in India, we have SPDI or sensitive uh, personal data and information. That concept has just been done away with. And all data that is personal needs to have the strict compliance for uh, consent and notice, et cetera, et cetera. So this, I feel, is a, uh, is, is a great change. And you know, we're not going to go down the route of, oh, is this personal data? Is this sensitive data? Is this critical data? And things like that. Right? In terms of who are the key stakeholders, we have the data principal who's the individual uh, whose data it is, that's you and me. Uh, we have the data fiduciary who basically determines the process and the means for in which the data needs to be processed. So that would usually be your insurance companies. It would also typically, I feel, uh, include brokers because brokers are representing the uh, insured. But when it comes to corporate agents, it's an area of gray, essentially because uh, a as an agent, you are um, acting on behalf of the principal, and therefore he, the fiduciary or the insurer would be liable um, for acts that you have done within the ambit of your scope, right? And then we have the data uh, processor, which is essentially all your tech companies uh, that are pro processing data on behalf of insurers, or you put some tech platform on their systems that are um, assisting them from a tech aspect. Uh, just rights of the data principle, uh, essentially as an individual, I get to know, um, you know, whether A, are you processing my data? What data of mine are you processing? Uh, how is my data being processed? Who is processing my data? You know, I need you to update my data. I need you to show me the data that you're actually collecting. If I want you, I can ask you to stop using my data. And in case of death, then um, my legal heirs are the ones who have the right to um, decide about whether my data needs to be deleted and I needed to redress uh, any grievance that I may have, right? From a data fiduciary perspective, um, you know, you, I need, as, a, as, a, as an insurance company or as uh, anyone who's uh, basically de determining how the data is going to be collected, you need to give notice, you take consent, you can only collect uh, what is required. Again, we spoke about lawful purpose. Um, you have to collect complete information and that becomes onerous because you are not always in control of the amount of data that you're actually receiving. You've got to update the information. Uh, you can only store what is required. Uh, you need to implement technical and organizational measures for compliance. Again, what does that amount to is something that the rules will come out with. Right now, we don't exactly know how this is going to pan out. Uh, there needs to be full transparency in processing. Uh, you need to safeguard the information. And if there's a breach, you need to report the breach. So as you can see, there's extensive compliance requirements on the uh, data fiduciaries, and effectively non-compliance can result in penalties up to 250 crores. So it's not a small sum of money and needs to be taken pretty seriously, right? And if there's a grievance, you need to have a grievance redressal also in place, so yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is a slide actually that, uh, you know, I, I really enjoy talking about. And if you, this is just gives you the life cycle of an insurance policy. And, you know, you see that, you know, the insurer can collect data either from the intermediary or directly through the customer. And then as we move, you know, the, once the inf information is collected, um, 
essentially, you know, it gets stored externally with your repositories like IIB. I mean, IIB gave a presentation. You have your servicing vendors. Um, you have your claim settlements, marketing, legal, and operations. So there are multiple organizations, both inside as well as outside the insurer or the data fiduciary, that are going to be receiving, processing, and storing or even transmitting the data. So uh, effectively, there's, going to, there's a lot of data movement just for a simple policy. And all, um, you know, all those who are collecting data will need to ensure that they are in compliance with the act. Any questions on this particular slide or so far? Because typically people want to understand how the data moves and where their obligations would lie. No? Okay, thanks. So like we spoke about, uh, monetary penalties can extend up to 250 crores depending on the nature of the non-compliance and whether you're a repeat offender or not. And all the penalties under the Data Protection Act actually are in addition to um, penalties under other laws. So, you know, you could also be slapped with an IRDA penalty um, in addition to a data protection um, penalty for uh, non-compliances. Um, key concerns, we spoke about insurance intermediaries, um, you know, whether they would essentially, um, whether there'd be data processors, data fiduciaries, depending on the nature of the insurance intermediary, uh, data quality, um, you know, insurance companies cannot be made responsible for ensuring the accuracy of the data. Uh, I think that becomes a logistical nightmare for them. Uh, you know, then to make the insurer solely responsible for all acts of the, um, you know, by your processors, something that's going to be difficult. Um, when we look at it from a data processor's perspective, uh, essentially they're going to land up having to give back-to-back -back indemnities to the insurer. And that is something that will need to be factored into their cost of doing business as well. Um, yes, there's another requirement that information from data fiduciaries uh, you need to share in all details of all data fiduciary uh, to, the, uh, to whom the data is going to be transferred um, to the individual. And that's going to base, that could compromise uh, you know, your business uh, information or proprietary information or any competitive advantage that you may have also. And just in terms of uh, implementation, you know, uh, people expect 24 to 30 months. I don't see that really happening. I think at best we're going to get about 12, maybe 18 months. Uh, the rules are supposed to come out in the next 30 days. That's what was uh, said, I think, a uh, couple of days ago. So once that comes out, we'll have a little more visibility on how quickly things are going to move. Uh, in terms of there's, you know, in terms of costs, you know, costs will need to be determined because there are, there are costs of compliance um, as well as uh, obligations on your notice and consent, etc. And uh, there's going to be compliance if you are a significant data fiduciary collecting. Uh, large volumes of quantum of data, then you do fall within a significant data fiduciary, in which case, um, again, um, you know, there'll be additional uh, compliance requirements like audits and assessments, et cetera. Uh, just in terms of uh, way forward, uh, you need to just do a quick assessment of your uh, existing systems and processes, um, you know, understand what, where your gaps are in terms of collecting data, storing data, transmitting data, et cetera, consents, notices, uh, you need to rework those depend on based on the rules. Um, you need to review your contracts with uh, third parties, um, service providers, and like I said, you know, may need to have back-to-back -back indemnities uh, for data breaches by your uh, data processors. And you have to do an uh, overall review of your internal systems. And sorry, and um, yeah, sorry. Oh, can we just put that up again? Sorry. Thanks, yeah. And uh, yeah, and uh, basically you need to look if you want to take cyber insurance, uh, you know, take a cyber insurance cover because uh, it's effectively um, that's something that is going to help you at least b with business continuity were a fine to be imposed. Any questions? Sorry. Yes. They might eventually get the consent uh, as a surrogacy. So, is the will it will it define that yes, you need to show in bold and highlight that yes, this is being used? Uh, will it specify in that level of R getting the consent? R right. 
So the consent, that's a great question. You know, the consent requirement basically says that it needs to be free, it needs to be express, it, needs, it cannot be implied, it needs to be specific. So if it's express, free, and specific, effectively I'm going to have to give significant amounts of detail so that someone who, is, um, who does not understand where my data is going to move as the layman as the assured actually has uh, complete awareness as to um, what he's giving consent for. So the notice will have to include all that. So it can't just be an implied consent that one nicely puts in their consent uh, paragraph as a click wrap agreement on the TNCs of your website, that's not going to work. There will need to be detailed uh, uh, information that is shared, and, uh, but that it can still be on your click wrap agreement on your website, but it, the details shared will need to be uh, definitely more, um, more detailed. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Hi. Uh, first and foremost, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Now, just a quick one, right? I mean, we all understand how organizations collect consent, right? So even though they may detail that, okay, I'm collecting your consent for these 10 points, but for example, you know, especially in the chart that you showed, uh, you know, the, the flow, you know, uh, the insurance policy buying journey one. Yeah. So, just I mean, as a customer, I may be okay giving you consent to let's say for example underwrite my policy or reach out to me from a claims perspective right. but i'm still not okay giving you a consent to reach out to me for renewals now that kind of a bifurcation obviously no sorry to reach out to me for for renewals renewals okay right so that kind of a consent i'm sure no insurer would want to build in their you know consent journey but again that's a loophole because eventually the only thing which is changing today is instead of a one single tick they're still mentioning those 10 points but you still have to Take it by default unless otherwise, if you do it, the journey would not move forward. Right. So how do you overtake a situation like that? Because to a customer, it's still not solving the problem. I don't want my insurer to reach out to me for renewals, but I'm still okay when they reach out to me for maybe a claims or something of that sort. Yeah, so uh, while you know the, the individual does have a lot of um, power and, or you know the right to decide um, how his information can be collected, stored, transferred, etc. I, as the company, have the right not to provide the services if they do not give me the consent. So uh, if, if I, as the insured, say that, okay, I'm comfortable with you um, taking my, uh, uh, and I'm giving you consent, let's say, for, um, for underwriting, for operations, you know, for claim settlement, et cetera, but I'm not gonna give it to you for renewal. Um, effectively, as an insurer, you may say that, okay, then I don't want to service your policy and you may not accept it. So that choice is yours. The, the bigger challenge is that, um, you know, we said that you need to basically inform each, um, you know, you need to give clear information as to each fiduciary to whom you're going to share the, de the data. And that becomes a bigger challenge because today, while um, you may be uh, writing a life policy, you don't know who the uh, reinsurer is going to be. That may happen at a later stage, right? So effectively, how that is going to play out also needs to be seen. So you may be only able to say that I'm going to be able to give it to a reinsurer, but who that reinsurer is, I don't know. And I, as the customer, may say, but I want to know who that reinsurer is, and if you're not able to give me that, and for rightly so, you can choose not to provide me the policy. That's your prerogative. Okay, does thanks. that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that does. That does. Yeah. Just a follow-up question to that in case if you have time. Yeah. Uh, once the consent is given, say, for example, the policy gets issued, right? Subsequently, I want to revoke the consent only for renewals. Now, is yeah. that a provision in the law? So what the law says is that I have the right at any point in time to ask you to stop using my data, and you have the right at that point in time to stop providing me the services. Good. Great. Thanks. Because th there has to be a uh, you know, I mean, balance, right? I mean, I, I, I can't, have, I can't uh, eat my cake and still have it. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, my question is on uh, owners, ownership. So in this particular uh, life cycle, yeah. uh, health insurance would have been sold through a particular POSP channel. Uh, the data would have gone to a TPA. The TPA would have asked, uh, sent the data across to a medical lab in some remote corner. So here, who, uh, who has ownership obligation as well as the onus of ensuring data compliance and who gets penalized in the pre-sales process especially? Right, so when we look at it from a TPA perspective, right, uh, effectively I'm the, uh, the, the data is provided by the insurer to the uh, TPA. As the TPA, you are only going to act as per the instructions of the insurer. 
in which case the TPA will become a data processor and the insurer will remain the data fiduciary. It's only the entity that decides how the data is going to be processed. That's when you become a data fiduciary. Got it. So it is the obligation of the DP to ensure that the labs that it works with needs to maintain the data compliance requirement that it Sorry, mandates. It is, it is the responsibility of? Is it the responsibility of the DPA to enforce on the labs that if I send you a customer data and if you send me the health data back, you have to have certain uh, guardrails around it? So, so look, the TPA is going to act at the behest of the insurer, and then the TPA is then going to coordinate with the labs, right? So the TPA is effectively a middleman that is uh, basically only doing the coordination and the processing. So the, so the insurer will take a back-to-back -back from the TPA for any non-compliance, and the TPA will end up taking a back-to-back -back indemnity from the lab. And if the policy has not been issued, the right. insurer has basically declined the policy. Right. What happens to the data at that point? Like who has it, ownership of it? It gets deleted, right? Because okay. there's, there's no reason for you to keep that data. Right. right. Got it. But uh, from a regulatory standpoint, a lab is allowed to keep that data for two years. It, so if yeah. you are required under any other law to keep that data, then you have to keep that data. Got it. So IRDA has its own you know, retention of records regulation. So. Uh, the uh, an insurance entity that you know that needs to follow that will follow that and uh, to that extent the data protection uh, law will um, will be subservient to the IRDA regulations sure thank you yeah yes hi uh, Jahan. this hi. is Vijay uh, CEO of Attributum InsurTech so I have Vijay. two questions uh, sure. one is uh, there is right to recall my data yes and uh, there is right to modify my data Right uh, now, where does where do these rights? Uh, who is incumbent to service these rights? Is it the fiduciary or even the processors? Why I ask this question is because some of the processors, data processors, which are the servicing vendors like us, most of the insure techs here are servicing vendors. Uh, I'm here to assume. Uh, now, there is a certain amount of time for which we hold the data. Now, is it incumbent on us? Because the insurer may not even have the customer data at that point in time, uh, in, in many cases. So is it incumbent on us to uh, for those rights of the customers, or is it only with the data fiduciary? OK, so before I answer that, can I ask you, why are you still holding the data? Uh, it, it could be for various reasons. Now, the insurer has outsourced uh, certain functions for example, uh, you know, uh, acquisition, customer acquisition, right from getting the customer's data to verifying, validating their data and things like that. There is a lead time to that. So till that time, I'm holding the data. Then that's that. Right. Could be so reason. see, as long as you are holding the data and you are acting at the behest of the insurer, you are a uh, data processor. Right. Okay. Uh, the moment you start holding the data outside of that, then you are the data fiduciary, and then the question will come to you as to why are you holding that data because you have no legitimate use for it. Right. Because outside of your relationship with the insurer, you have no legitimate use for holding that data. True. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, it answers one part of my okay, question. So but the, sorry, second, yeah. the second part of my question is, uh, in case, uh, I think uh, you answered partly when you are answering the previous question, in case the customer does not get into the insurance system and the data remains with us and there is a breach, who has to report that breach, for example? But, the, but before that breach happens, you are already in breach because you are retaining the data when there's no reason for you to retain the data, right? So then that actually becomes a double breach, right? And if there's a data breach, then the question will, be, uh, will need to be determined as to why has there been a data breach? Has there been a data breach because of a... a, a something that's gone wrong at your end or are you have you suddenly become a victim of ransomware then if you see if you're a victim of ransomware then that's a different discussion altogether that's a different question. Yeah. right but if if the data breach has happened because you have a mischief monger employee then that's a different liability altogether but pre before that the question will come to you okay, why have you why kept the you data the why data? have you kept the data when he's no longer a, if he's not an assured and there is no servicing of the policy why are you keeping this data great that answers my question. Yeah. Sorry, there is one more follow-up sure, question. Sure, I'm sorry, please. I'm asking too many questions. I'm not in a rush, I mean, but. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there are certain elements of the data which are used as insight. Now, many of the analytics uh, uh, vendors here might understand that. Uh, you actually don't own the data, but you are owning the insights that are collected from the data. What is the position of uh, the Data Privacy Act on such elements of data? 
I, I'm not an analyst, but if you can tell me what do you mean exactly by insights? Let's say I create models without uh, personal information. That's fine. That's anonymized data. No, then the, see, as long as you see, you you can have models. For example, okay, you say that okay, there's a male, 40 year old, lives in Bombay, high BP and diabetic. For example, the, can you identify that person in this room? The answer is no. Right. But if you say Jehan Shroff, senior partner, consortia legal, there's only one over here. Right. So you can identify that individual, right? And that is why the definition of personal data becomes important to basically say that, uh, you know, it identifies the individual as that particular person only. So, in, in a, so take a reinsurance example. Typically, there is not really any transfer of personal data, right? Aggregated will, information. Yeah, it's aggregated information. You, you may say that, look, you know, I have all these um, policies effectively. And... Um, Essentially, you know, they basically deal with, um, so it's all my fire, let's say it's all my fire policies in Bombay, and uh, that's it, right? So that, that doesn't identify the individual. Thanks. Yeah? That sure. ends. Any, anything else? Are we done? Sorry? Yeah? Okay. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Thank